factors that affect the rate of dissolving and solubility. That is today's uh, lecture. The rate of dissolving is very important property of solutions. The rate of dissolving depends on several factors, and here they are. First one, temperature, agitation, particle size. So, we look at temperature. We increase the temperature, we can dissolve more. More, can, more solute can actually dissolve in a, in a solvent. We saw this when we were talking about saturation in the previous lecture on types of solutions. Agitation, so just how quickly we shake it, right? Think about it, you, you're, you're mixing, mixing Nestle quick, right? The powder into your, your regular milk, right? If you want to make chocolate milk. And what you do is you, you stir it, right? But you still have clumps of the... Um, you know, of the Nestle Quick, and you want to, you don't really want to drink that, right? So you're going to, you know, shake, you know, stir it even more rapidly because you want to try to break up all those pieces and try to get the, um, you know, all the little chunks, all the little, you know, particles, uh, you know, that powder into the milk so it kind of forms a consistent liquid. Okay, and then finally, particle size. So, factors that affect the rate of dissolving. For most solid solutes, the rate of dissolving is greater at higher temperatures. So, the higher the temperature is, the more you can dissolve of the solute. That's how it typically works out. But you will see um, how some things really don't matter. At high temperatures, the solvent molecules have greater kinetic energy and collide with undissolved solid mo molecules more frequently. So when you increase, so a few things, when you increase the temperature of an object, you're increasing the kinetic energy, the movement, right? These particles are vibrating at a solid, right? And once we, we, we cause that solid to melt, the particles are, you know, they're, they're, the kinetic energy is increasing, right? They're, they're, the particles are moving even more rapidly. And then eventually we continue to add heat to it and we cause that liquid to evaporate now those particles are just going crazy as a gas, right? So as we increase them, the more particles that are able to move, the more they can actually collide with the other molecules, the other solid molecules that are moving a little bit slower, right? These are the undissolved ones. And we can get them to pretty much react with the others and, and cause them to, um, to dissolve. Agitating a mixture by stirring or shaking the container also increases the rate of dissolving, right? Think about also uh, protein powders, right? If you're one of those, you know, work out in the gym and you got the protein shakes and you're trying to get it to mix, and of course, you're gonna shake, you know, you really shake it to try to get the, that, you know, that powder to dissolve within the liquid that you're, you're um, uh, you know, that you're, you're stirring, that you're mixing together. Agitation brings fresh solvent into contact with undissolved solute. So you're getting particles of your milk or your water, whatever, your juice that you're using in the protein shake, and you're getting the solvent parts of the liquid to try to make contact with other parts of the solute, other parts of that protein powder to try to get that part to, uh, to dissolve. Now, decreasing the size of particles increases the rate of dissolving, right? You throw in a whole, um, like a, a sugar cube, and it's gonna take longer to dissolve than if you were to pour in an actual teaspoon of sugar into a warm drink, all right? So you mix that in and it'll be easier to dissolve because they're already broken up into their smaller pieces. But you put in that clump now and that will take longer if you don't agitate it, right? If you don't stir it or mix it, if you just let it to try to dissolve. When you break up a large mass of solute into smaller pieces, you increase the surface area that is in contact with the solvent. So let's say we have that that cube of, um, of sugar. So the surface area is everything around it, right? So we've got everything around it. And that's what's, what the solvent is going to come in contact. So the solvent cannot come in contact with anything that's inside of it. So if you break this cube up into little pieces, right, the solvent is now acting on a greater amount of this solute to cause it to dissolve. Okay, so you're breaking up the pieces and now you're allowing the solvent to combine with inner parts of this larger solute. Solubility and particle attractions. The reasons why a solute may or may not dissolve in a solvent are related to the forces of attraction between the solute and the solvent particles. 
when the forces of attraction between different particles in a mixture are stronger than the forces of attraction between like particles in a mixture, a solution forms. So what we're looking at is, you know, what kind of, a, of attraction are we getting? Are we getting like with like? Are we getting unlike with unlike? Right? We think about when we're trying to mix something like oil and water. They don't like one another. Right? So they're not, you know, they, they're, there isn't really that much of a compatibility between the two. So we're going to struggle. So, and we're going to see a little more about the, the like dissolving like in, in just a second. The three-step process of dissolving at the molecular level. Here they are. Step one. The forces between the particles in a solid must be broken. This step, this step always requires energy. Okay? So the forces that are found between the particles within the solid, as we, we, we've shown right, with that sugar cube, we, 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 we need to break that down. So we are exerting some kind of energy. right? We're, we're, we're either mashing it up or something. Right? In an ionic solid, though, the forces that are holding the ions together also must be broken. So we look at something like sodium chloride, right? Table salt, NaCl. It's an ionic bond that is formed between Na and the Cl. So we have to be able to break that apart. And that's what we do when we get, right? Na breaks apart from Cl, and Na is positively charged. Chlorine uh, is negatively charged. And we've got all these molecules of water, okay, that pretty much surround each molecule or each, um, each ion. And finally, in a molecular solid, the forces between the molecules must be broken. So we're looking at um, something like, you know, sugar molecules that they're held together. Um, and so what we do, we need, we need to break apart that, um, that bond that is formed between one molecule of sugar with the other. And so we want to break that apart, okay, into individual monosaccharides, so to speak, uh, biological uh, level. Okay, so steps two and three. So steps two, some of the intermolecular forces between the particles in a liquid must be broken. This step also in, in, involves uh, the use of energy. And finally, step three, there is an attraction between the particles of a solid and the particles of a liquid. And this step always gives off energy. Polar and non-polar substances. So, we have a polar compound. It dissolves in a polar solvent. Okay, so polar compound, polar solute, dissolving in a polar solvent. We have a non-polar compound or a non-polar solute dissolves in a nonpolar solvent, right? So we've got nonpolar compound, so solute, solute. So polar in polar, nonpolar in nonpolar. Now let's, let's see what happens when we try to intermingle nonpolar with polar. Okay, so if we're trying to go from polar to nonpolar solvent or from nonpolar solute to a polar solvent, do not dissolve in. Okay, so like dissolves like. If something is polar, a polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent. In a non-polar solute will dissolve in a non-polar solvent. But here, the idea of oil not mixing in with water. So let's say oil. Oil is your non-polar solute. Water being your polar solvent, obviously. Do not dissolve. But even though we've talked about it, and we are going to see there is a minuscule amount, but it's so little that it's not really considered. And that's why we consider oil being insoluble to water or within water. Now, solubility and intermolecular forces. Water molecules are polar. So, molecules such as water have charges separated into positive and negative regions. They are considered to have a permanent dipole. So, what we have here, we have the oxygen that is slightly negative, right? If we look at the electronegativity as we've looked at in previous chapters, uh, yeah, so oxygen is going to carry a slight negative charge, the hydrogens are going to carry a slight positive charge, and there is that force of attraction there, that, uh, that hydrogen bond that actually forms between molecules of water. And that's what makes uh, water molecules have the properties that they have. 
Think about when you're, you're filling up uh, a glass of water, that, you know, and, and you can try this at home. It's a really safe experiment. Try to fill up water to the brim, or you know, and then try to add just drops, and you'll see that you'll be able to fill water up just slightly above the brim because water has that cohesion, right? Because, you know, the, the, the hydrogen uh, molecule from, oh, sorry, the hydrogen of one molecule of water is attracted to the oxygen of another. And eventually it's gravity that kind of kicks in and, and causes maybe that to, to overflow beyond it, right? But you, you, you do have that ability to uh, allow for the water to actually go above the brim. A dipole consists of two opposite charges that are separated by a short distance. And that short distance here, as formed by the hydrogen bond that kind of separates, that keeps them together but still has that separation. It separates each molecule of water from one another. A dipole-dipole attraction. Dipole-dipole attractions are attractions between opposite charges on two different polar molecules. Right, so we're looking at two completely different polar molecules that are attracted. We, with the example we showed you before, it was one molecule of water with another water molecule. Okay? They're both the same type of polar molecule. But here, a dipole-dipole attraction is that of one polar compound with another polar compound. These attractions are considered intermolecular. Okay, so if the force is greater between two different dipoles, then between the dipoles on the same molecule, then the solute will dissolve in the solvent. Then we have here an ion dipole attraction. The positive end of a polar molecule attracts the anion. The negative end of the dipole attracts the cation. So what we're looking at is something like salt dissolving in water. Right? So we have um, Na which is positively charged, Cl, which is negatively charged. And we talked about the, um, the dipole attraction within water and how water, right, oxygen is slightly negative, hydrogen is slightly positive. So there's going to be this attraction between the oxygen molecule of the water with the Na of the salt. Right? So then we have the Cl, which is negatively charged, which means it will be attracted to the slightly positive hydrogens of a water molecule, right? So opposites attract, right? So this H, which is slightly positive, this chlorine, which is slightly negative, there's going to be an attraction that occurs between these two, right? That's why the oxygen is going to be completely away from the, the chlorine, because the oxygen is slightly negative, chlorine being negative, right? They're, they're like charges. They will repel one another, so it will kind of rearrange the water molecule in a way where it will allow the hydrogens of the water molecule to surround the chlorine, while with sodium, it will allow the oxygen molecules to surround the sodium. Sorry for writing over some of the text. Okay, so notice here with the, the, NA, the Na part of the NaCl, all the oxygens, which are slightly negative, are going to be attracted to the, uh, each one of the sodium ions. So, ionic compounds will dissolve in polar solvents. So, sodium chloride being ionic compound will dissolve in something that is polar, being the water. Hydration of ions. We've talked about hydrates, um, the, the whole, the dot, you know, the H2O at the end, okay? So, when molecules, water molecules completely surround an ion. So, what we have here is we've got our anion, and as we just showed you, right, so imagine this being... Uh, the chlorine part, right? The Cl uh, being negatively charged. And notice how it's the hydrogens that are pointed in the direction of the anion. Sorry, I used red. I should have used something like blue here. Okay, this is the chlorine, right? So let's look at So we've got that. And so here, let's look at this one again. Cl, chlorine being the middle. Notice what's pointed in the direction of the negatively charged um, uh, chlorine, right? So it's the slightly positive charge of water. On the other end, we have the cation. So this was, let's say, the sodium, right? Sodium is positively charged. Notice what part is pointed in the direction of the cation, right? Being the sodium ion, 
All right? It's the part of the oxygen which is slightly negative according to electronegativity. An electrolyte is a solution that can conduct electricity. Not all ionic compounds are soluble in water because the force of attraction within ionic compounds are too strong. An example of that would be silver chloride. It's one to, uh, to remember, one example to remember. Predicting solubility. We're going to look a little more about predicting solubility um, in, in an upcoming chapter uh, where we will be looking at the guidelines to solubility. But for now, we're just going to look at the following. We're going to use differences in electronegativities to determine ionic nature of the compounds to help predict solubility. Now, predicting solubility is not as cut and dry as it is. You know, if it's this, it's that, whatever. You know, so we're going to be using the guidelines and and I will be providing you guys the guidelines. But there are a few things that I, I hope you remember in terms of solubility and know that if you see these certain compounds, they will always uh, be soluble, regardless. Now, if the elements are polar or ionic, then the compound will probably dissolve in water. Okay, so it's in terms of solubility, we know something is, is polar, right? Water, also polar. So if it's polar, it will dissolve in water. Ionic will dissolve in water, most of them. Right? Example of an ionic, as we said, sodium chloride will dissolve in water. If the elements are nonpolar, then the compound will probably not dissolve in water. Example of something that's nonpolar. Right? Something like uh, CH4, methane. Right? Here, CH. Oops. C, single bond to H's. If you look at the electronegativity, you're going to notice that they're nonpolar, which means neither the C or the H is slightly positive or slightly negative, which means they will not dissolve within the water. Solubility of covalent compounds. Covalent compounds do not have dipole charges. They are not soluble in water. Exceptions are... Methanol, ethanol, and sugars. They're able to form hydrogen bonds with water, which allows them to behave similar to ionic compounds. Okay, they have certain ends that, are, that have the ability to interact with, with water molecules and allow them to, uh, to dissolve. When a molecule com molecular compound such as sugar or methanol dissolves in water, the solid breaks up into molecules which are coordinated by the water. Notice that the molecules remain intact even though they are dissolved in water. No ions are produced from the dissociation of a covalent compound. So if we look at the breakdown of, let's say, you know, a whole chain of, of uh, glucose molecules. Right? So here we have our ring of glucose. And it will remain the same. It, it will not break apart. So then, like this piece isn't going to break apart and this piece you know, and this piece is going to, it's going to remain intact as a, as a full pure substance. It's going to stay together as, a, as, a, you know, as, a, as an entity of its own, right, and as its full molecule. Okay, and so here's that example, right? This is not going to break apart. So what's going to happen is it's got these ends here, right, that will, let's say, be able to dissolve with others, right, and, and they do carry, um, you know, so if we look at this OH and we know the electronegativity, there's going to be a slightly negative, slightly positive um, attraction, let's say, with the OH. So the O and the H are, are, are bonded covalently, right? But if we look at electronegativity between the oxygen and the hydrogen bond, right, the oxygen is slightly negative, hydrogen is slightly positive. And this is what allows something like this covalent compound to be able to dissolve in water. Insoluble covalent compounds. They lack ions or polar bonds, therefore are unable to dissolve in polar sub substances or solvents. Sol solvents, sorry. <laughs> They're able to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Remember what we talked about way back when? Polar dissolves in polar solute solvents. Right? So polar polar solute in a polar solvent. Nonpolar solute in a nonpolar solvent. Right? They don't mix and match, right? Like dissolves like. 
if a compound possesses both polar and nonpolar components, it may dissolve in both types of solids. Okay. Here we have acetic acid able to form hydrogen bonds with water, and the CH3 end is considered nonpolar. So it's got your nonpolar entity to it, but it also has your polar aspect of it. So because it has the polar, it still is able to dissolve in a polar solvent such as water. So let's look at a few examples. Nonpolar solutes. Okay, iodine, hydrogen, oxygen, methane. Okay, these are considered nonpolar solutes. They will not dissolve in water. A few examples of polar solutes. Ammonia, ethanol, hydrochloric acid. Okay, these all have slightly positive, slightly negative ends that will allow for their interaction with the slightly negative oxygen, the slightly negative positive hydrogen. Nonpolar solvents. Okay, so these are nonpolar solvents. So we've got carbon tetrachloride, benzene. Okay, so these are things that, well, none of these solutes, these solutes will not be able to dissolve within these, right? Because remember, polar solutes dissolve in polar solvents. Nonpolar solutes dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So these can dissolve in these, but not these. Factors affecting solubility. Three factors that affect solubility. Molecule size, pressure, temperature. Very similar to the factors that are responsible um, to, well, that assist in dissolving of material. Okay? So notice these factors, very similar to the factors of dissolving, but do not confuse them. Because what did we have in the other one? Well, instead of pressure, we had agitation. We still had temperature, we still had size, but this, these three factors deal with solubility, not with dissolving. So we're looking at factors affecting solubility. Molecule size, generally the smaller the molecule, the more soluble it is. So let's look at um, a couple of these. Okay, so we have methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol, pentanol. Infinitely soluble, so very soluble, look at it. CH3OH, smallest molecule. Now we're adding CH2 to it. Still infinitely soluble, but it's still rather small. But now notice, very soluble. So infinitely, always soluble. Okay, so missable, very missable. So we're still very soluble, but not as soluble as infinitely. Notice now, as we're adding more carbons and hydrogens, and we're reaching the butanol and the pentanol levels. Notice the, the, um, the number of grams that are dissolving in 100 milliliters of water, and this is at the temperature of 25 degrees. And we know as we increase temperature, we can dissolve more within a given amount of volume. And then look at this. We add another CH2 to the mix, and we reduce the amount that we can actually dissolve it. So that we, we reduce the solubility. So, as the size here decreases, okay, so size decreases in this direction, right, notice how the solubility also decreases in the same direction. So molecule size, the bigger the molecule, the less likely it will be able to, to be soluble. So solubility uh, is better for those molecules that are smaller. Pressure usually affects gases. As pressure above the surface of a solvent increases, the solubility of gases also increases. Okay, so think about, uh, you know, your pop bottles, right? The, 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 the amount of pressure that's, that's within that bottle, right? The, the, the gas that is dissolved within that liquid, right? So as we, the surface of the solvent increases, solubility of the gases also increases. Temperature, three different, uh, uh, three different things affect, and depending on the state of matter, okay, solids, liquids, gases, so solids. As temperature increases, solubility also increases. So 
in order to overcome the strong intermolecular forces of attraction, okay, the temperature has to increase. And by increasing the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy, therefore giving the molecules more energy to allow them to be soluble. Right? Liquids. Solubility of liquids are generally unaffected by changes in temperature. It doesn't really matter, right? They're liquids. They're already at that liquid stage. So really not much. But if we're looking at solids, in order to overcome that, 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 the force that's held between that solid within that, the, the, the liquid or the solvent, okay, we need to uh, increase the temperature, right? We need to increase that kinetic energy. We looked at that uh, previously. Gases, solubility of gases decreases as temperature increases because ja gases lose energy as they dissolve. Therefore, any increase in temperature gives the gas more energy and therefore lowers the, um, the solubility. Okay. So we really, we don't want to, uh, to increase the temperatures of gases for that matter. Temperature and solubility of solids. Increased temperature usually increases the solubility of solids in liquids. According to the second law of thermodynamics, increased temperature means a greater average velocity for the particles, right? Particles, as we, we add heat to them, right? They start to move even more rapidly. We talked about this in the previous lecture. Uh, this allows them to move from one position to another more easily. The greater the freedom of movement allows a system to change its state more easily. Right? So we're looking, we're changing from solid to a liquid to a gas. What do we do? We need to increase the temperature. We increase the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy, we allow more energy there uh, to these particles. These particles now have no choice but to bump away from one another and actually make their way um, you know, and break away from their state of matter, whatever they're in, solid to liquid to gas. Now, the change in solubility uh, with change in temperature can be used to cre create solutions with more solute dissolved than is predicted by the solubility of the substance. So, here we have the following. Notice here as the temperature increases from 25 degrees as our lowest to 90 degrees Celsius. So what we have here is the solubility in grams of glucose per 100 milliliters of water. So here, we have 91 grams of glucose can dissolve in 100 milliliters of water, right? And as we increase the temperature from 25 degrees to 90 degrees, look at the amount that we can actually dissolve. 556 grams of glucose can dissolve within 100 milliliters of water. So notice, temperature is increasing, more solute can dissolve. So, if we add 100 grams of glucose to 100 milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius, only 91 grams, okay, only 91 grams will actually dissolve in water. The remaining nine grams, okay, is gonna remain at the bottom and the solution is saturated at this temperature. So, the solvent is holding the maximum amount that it can have had dissolved within it. Okay, the maximum amount, 91 which means we've got an excess of nine grams, right? If I want to dissolve those nine grams, what do I need to do? I need to increase the temperature, right? Because I need nine more grams, let's say, to dissolve. But I've already fulfilled my maximum, so it's a saturated solution. I've dissolved the maximum amount that I possibly can. If we heat the mixture up to 50 degrees Celsius, the remaining nine grams of glucose will dissolve. And at the new temperature, the solubility limit in 100 milliliters of water is 246 grams. With only 100 grams of glucose dissolved, our system is now considered unsaturated. Now, we went from saturated to unsaturated. Why? Well, we've increased the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius. At 50 degrees Celsius, we can dissolve up to 244, but we've only put in 100 grams. We put in 100 grams at 25 degrees Celsius, we only dissolve 91 grams. We increase the temperature to 50, it dissolved the remaining 9 grams, which now I have room to dissolve even more sugar, okay, more glucose in that solution, right, because, well, I've got room for it. Because I have room for it, that's what makes it unsaturated. So if I have an unsaturated solution, I have more room to dissolve more solute.
if we slowly cool the mixture back to 25 degrees Celsius, nine grams of glucose should precipitate from solution. Sometimes this happens immediately, but sometimes it takes a while for the glucose molecules to find their positions in a solid structure. So what we have here is, well, we tried to dissolve 100 grams. We did it in the 100 milliliters, but we had to raise the temperature above 25 degrees Celsius. But if we cool it back down, right, we've dissolved 100 because we've raised the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius but we've lowered it back to 25. At 25, I was only allowed to dissolve 91 grams, which means the remaining nine grams is actually gonna precipitate. It's gonna be the, the, the last little bit of solute that was not able to dissolve in my solution. Okay. So in the time between the cooling of the solution and the formation of glucose crystals, the system has a higher amount of dissolved glucose, 100 grams, than is predicted by the solubility limit of 25 uh, degrees Celsius, which is at 91 grams. Because the solubility, or because the sol solution contains more dissolved solute than is predicted by the solubility limit, this is when we call a super saturated solution. Because even though we've lowered the temperature, it still has more solute than it can hold. And until that, you know, finally kind of, you know, gets back where, remember, the solid is not just going to clump together and start to form, okay? So because it hasn't done that, it's considered super saturated, right? Imagine, it's anything that's super saturated, it's got more, right? Saturated means it's got the most amount that it possibly can hold, that's allowed to be hold, held, scientifically. But then we have super saturated, which means it holds even more than theoretically it can hold. Okay, so here we have, uh, so we've got in uh, the 100 milliliters, so we, sorry, 100 grams in the 100 milliliters of water. So at 25 degrees, we've reached something called a dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium meaning we've got, we're holding the most amount, right? It's equal and it's not gonna change. This remaining nine grams is gonna remain that way. Maybe some might dissolve out while others are going to re-solidify itself. Okay, so, but it's reached that point where it, it will remain 91 grams, right, to 9 grams. So 91 grams that is, is uh, dissolved to 9 grams that is undissolved, right? We're going to add heat to it to the point where we're going to dissolve all 100 grams of the glucose. We're going to cool it down, okay, we're going to cool it down to 25 degrees, we still have 100 grams. It hasn't precipitated yet because it hasn't precipitated, right? It's not gonna just gonna do it magically, right? We've lowered the temperature, bam. There, you know, where it's gonna bring. Eventually over time, right? The nine grams that is still left over is going to precipitate itself. But before that, we reach something called supersaturation. We've got more solute that we technically should be able to dissolve. But as time goes on, Right? The particles are going to kind of solidify and we will reach that dynamic equilibrium which is considered a saturated solution where only 91 grams will be dissolved which will allow the 9 grams to precipitate back because we can't dissolve more than 91 grams at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, This is a common way that we use actually to produce rock candy. Solubility curves. Solutes normally dissolve in a particular solvent up to a limit. The maximum mass of solute which dissolves in 100 grams of a given solvent is called the solubility of the solute in that solvent. Right? So since solubility depends on the temperature, one should always take the temperature at which the solubility is measured. So we looked at the other example and we said 91 grams per 100 milliliters. Right? So we know that's the solubility, but we have to say at 25 degrees Celsius because this amount can change. This amount changes based on whatever the temperature is. So if the temperature increases, this amount that can dissolve the solubility increases as well. We lower that temperature, the amount of solute that can, that can dissolve, so the solubility lowers. 
substances vary widely in their solubility behavior as shown here in the following solubility curve. Solubility curves can use, be used to identify unknown substances as solubility is a characteristic property. Right? So solubility is an actual characteristic property. So we look at these temperatures here. Right? Notice the curve with certain types of ionic substances. Right? So the amount of solubility that actually increases depending on um, you know, whatever given temperature that we have. So let's look at a problem where we can actually use this solubility curve here. So, in this first sample problem, if potassium chloride, oh, sorry, cl potassium chlorate, sorry, solution is cooled from 80 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius, what mass will precipitate out of solution? So, we look at precipi uh, the, uh, the potassium chlorate, which is this one in this light blue. So, we look at the 80 degrees Celsius mark, so here's 80 degrees, and we look at 50 degrees. So here's this point, here is our other point. So at 80 degrees, okay, at 80 degrees Celsius, 35 grams will dissolve in 100 um, grams of water. Okay, we're using grams of water according to this chart. We've looked at milliliters. If you want, you can treat it as milliliters. Now, at 50 degrees Celsius, 18 grams of potassium chlorate will dissolve in 100 grams of water. So, now, how much will actually, what mass will actually precipitate out? So we're going from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. Because we're doing that, we know that it's going to be super saturated. It's going to be super saturated until it precipitates itself out. So what do we do? Well, we take the two values and we subtract them. 35 grams minus 18 grams based on the numbers we found here on the solubility curve. And we subtract the two together to get 17 grams of potassium chlorate Okay, will precipitate from this solution. So we just take the two values and we subtract them to one another. So that's a nice simple uh, sample problem. Let's look at another one where we actually involve a, an extra step. A saturated solution of potassium nitrate is cooled from 50 degrees Celsius to 100 uh, degrees Celsius. How many grams of this salt will precipitate out of 240 grams of water? So we have potassium, Nitrate. So here it is, the, the yellow curve. So we look for the, uh, the 50 degrees Celsius and we look at the 10 degrees Celsius here. And we take the two values, okay, and at 50 degrees Celsius, we are able to dissolve 80 grams in 100 grams of water. At 10 degrees Celsius, obviously, here in this example, temperature, um, we're lowering the temperature, so we'll be able to dissolve a lot less. We can only dissolve 19 grams per 100 grams of water. So 80, 80 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water. We lower the temperature, and we can only dissolve 19 grams per 100 grams of water. So we subtract the two. Okay, so 80 grams minus... 19 grams, and we know that we are able to dissolve, or not, 61 grams uh, will actually precipitate out from this uh, solution, which means only a lot less uh, will actually be dissolved within the solution. But now, we know it's a ratio. 61 grams per 100 grams will actually precipitate out. But now, we don't have 100 grams. We have 240 grams of water. So we want to find out how many grams per 240. But we know that if we went from 100 grams to 200 grams, we would just multiply this by 2. We multiply this by 2, which means we multiply that by 2. But we're trying to find the ratio, and we're not, it's not as cut and dry as multiplying by 2 to get to 240. So we have to figure it out. So we use this ratio. Right? Think about regular ratio in math class. So we isolate for x, we keep x alone, 
which means I'm going to bring this 240 over, and so I get 61 grams times 240 grams divided by 100 grams, right, grams of uh, the water divide out, and I'm left with whatever grams of solute is remaining. And the, uh, the, um, the mass of the potassium nitrate that is going to precipitate in a 240 gram um, so, uh, amount of solvent of water that we're going to have, we're going to form, we're going to precipitate out 146.4 grams of potassium nitrate will actually precipitate out if we had 240 grams of water that we're dissolving it in. Dissociation is the process of decomposing an ionic solid into its component ions. Okay. So we take, take an ionic compound like sodium chloride and we break it apart into its um, different ions. Right? Because when we dissolve it in water, right, the water will attack, you know, certain parts of the water will attack the sodium, certain parts of the water will attack the chlorine. Right? Because remember, according to electronegativity, a molecule of water, right, the oxygen is slightly more negative than the hydrogen, which means when we dissolve sodium chloride in water and it breaks apart, it ionizes, right, or dissociates, breaks apart, forming ions, notice the Na plus, the Cl negative. The Na plus, because it's positively charged, what part of the water is going to surround it? The oxygen, right? Because the oxygen right, is slightly negative and opposite to track. So when we have now the chloride, what part of the water is going to surround it? The hydrogen. So we've got the hydrogen part because the hydrogen part is slightly positive and the opposite to track. Okay, this is what we call the hydration of these ionic compounds. So whenever we dissolve something like that in water, this kind of dissociation is what occurs. So, aqueous means the ions are hydrated. The ions is surrounded by water molecules, what we have there, right? Whenever we said we saw aqueous, AQ, it means it's dissolved in water. How does it dissolve? Well, the ions of the ionic compound actually break apart into their positive and negative, their cations and anions. So, water molecules are electro electrically static, electrostatically uh, attracted to the ions. It's called the solvation of ions. So, what it's, what's occurring here, right, there's an electrostatic attraction, right, opposite charges. Okay, we have the Na positive, okay, the cation here, which is attracted to the oxygen part of the water molecule. We have the chloride anion, which is attracted to the hydrogen part of water. And it's what helps to dissolve the, um, these uh, type of ionic compounds. Now, when ionic compounds dissolve to produce ions, the process is typically called dissociation. Dissociation of ionic compounds occurs when water molecules pull apart the ionic crystals, right? With that example, the ionic, ionic crystals are the Na and the Cls, right? The positives and negatives. This occurs due to the strong attractions between the polar ends of the water molecule and the positive and negative ions within the crystal, right? Remember. This attraction of the polar ends, right? remember, oxygen, we said, is slightly negative. The hydrogens are slightly positive based on the change in the electronegativity. Right? That's how we can tell. And the positive and negative ions. Right? Something that is ionic, right? if we have something that is ionic, we know ionic compounds deal with combining a metal with a non-metal. Metals have a positive charge. Non-metals have a negative charge. 
Water molecules then surround the positive cations and negative anions in a process called hydration. But it doesn't surround it in the same way, right? Remember, the oxygen part is what it, you know, because it's slightly negative, attracted to the positive uh, cations. The, ne the, um, the positively charged hydrogens are attracted to the negatively charged anions of your um, ionic crystals. So, dissociate the following ionic compounds. So, take a moment, copy out these examples, and actually dissociate them based on their respective ions that they would form. Looking at the first example, NH4Cl, what is the cation? So, the cation is the positively charged aspect. Hmm? NH4. What is NH4? Ammonium ion, which has the plus one charge, right? So NH4 with the plus one charge, right? And it's aqueous, right? Because what's surrounding it right now? No, the water. What part of the water? The oxygen is what's surrounding, right? Which means the hydrogen part of water is going to be surrounding its other counterpart, which is the Cl negative. And that's all you have to do. All right. So we had the, uh, the oxygen part, right, because oxygen is slightly negative, is going to surround the ammonium. The hydrogen part, because it's slightly positive, is what's going to surround the uh, Cl negative. Let's look at the next example, PbSO4 in aqueous. Pb, not 2, positive 2, right? Pb plus 2. Right? Because remember, what, the ch what was the charge? And now, you know, I really don't want to go back, but I, we, you know, just to kind of reiterate. Remember, what charge does sulfate carry? It's a negative 2, right? We don't see any little subscripts here. So which means they must have been canceled out. Right? Which means they were simplified. Right? Which means that... The PB had to have been a plus 2, and the sulfate, which is obviously the negative 2. So the PB is a plus 2. So what part of the uh, water surrounds it? Uh, the oxygen, right? So the oxygen part of water surrounds all, okay, pretty much all the cations, right? Cations, positively charged. The hydrogen part of water surrounds all the anions when we dissociate these ionic crystals. Okay, so we have Pb plus 2, and what is our uh, anion? SO4, negative 2. Right, notice aqueous, right? Really important, guys, please do not forget the charges. Because if I don't have this, we don't know really what part of water is surrounding it when it when it when it's in that uh, hydration. So that's really really important. Uh, KOH. K positive one, and the hydroxide is OH negative. Now, what kind of compound is KOH? Base, base right? So this is a base. So not only is it dissociation here, but this is also the ionization of a base. And we'll talk more about that um, later on. The last one, what is the, uh, the cation? Sodium? Ion, right? But how many sodiums do I have? I have two, which means I put down two Na pluses, right? That's where the two comes in. And how many sulfates? Just one sulfate, right? Which is SO4 negative two aqueous. And as we said, the oxygen part of hydrogen, or sorry, of water, is what surrounds all the cations. The hydrogen parts of water during this hydration surrounds all the anions in our dissociation.